This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. All right, well, uh, you want to talk about uh, Wheel of Time? Yeah, let's let's move into doing our hopefully double header today. We're planning on doing a double header because we the events of these two chapters cover one day and we think that we're going to be able to talk about it all in one go. I mean, let's be honest. Robert Jordan wrote this as one chapter and Harriet said, nah, this is too long. Let's cut it somewhere. Yeah, probably. Because there's no logical reason to cut it where it's cut. You cut it earlier, later, whatever. But yeah, this is the courting of Tuon, right? This is the initiation of him not fighting it anymore. At this point, he is like, I'm going to buy you exactly the present you want. I am going to actually think that you're hot without caveats when I look at you. I am going to be willing to risk things for your smile. Like, he's been resistant, resistant, but less and less and less. It's gone now. He's completely in. He is 100% with two. And yeah, he is... This is not him presenting the gifts, but it is like the real gifts. You know, the dress was just an opening salvo. The real gifts, he hasn't even actually presented yet, but the acquisition is so deliberate that, yes, I would agree. This is the beginning of really courting to on. I do find it ironic that at, I'm at a time in my life when I am currently engaged and planning a marriage. And at the, this point in the podcast, we are reaching Matt getting like actually accepting his engagement and getting married. Like that's the part we're going to cover. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, there's something very ironic about the whole, I've, I've never been married my whole life. And now as we cover this part of the books, it's catching up to me. There's not a lot of points in the books that would have that timing. It's like, this no. is Shadow Rising, basically. <laughs> basically, yeah. Like Perrin, <laughs> Perrin and Fahil and then, yeah, Matt and Tuon. Yeah, no, that that is funny. You've been reading these books for a very long time, never in the process of getting married. Mm -mm. <laughs> and now the one time you're getting married, it's during one of the very few times that there's, yeah, engagement shenanigans happening. Right, right. Yeah, because that's what this is, right? He is engaged. That's what he did when he said, uh, she's my bloody wife three times, right? He got engaged to her and he she has to essentially accept the engagement to finish the marriage. It's her, it's now her prerogative to get married whenever she wants. Right. And he is now engaged in like the active verb sense, right? He is now engaging with the thing rather mm -hmm. than running away from mm -hmm. it. He is, he is engaged. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, and, and there's a couple of passages in these chapters that show just how in love he actually is, right? This like either. Yep. Whether yep. fate has determined it or if it's just, would he have fallen in love with her without knowing? You know, that's always the question about these sort of prophecies that are in some ways self-fulfilling. Is if he didn't know about the prophecy, would it, have, would, would it have still come true? Yeah, I would like to think that he would be inherently turned off from the head of a slave empire on basis of, you know, being a slaver. Without the prophecy, I would like to think that, but who's to say? I can fix her. That's what's I, running through his head. That's what's going say? through his head. Absolutely. Who I can fix her. She might, she might be the domineering uh, empress of a slave empire, but I, I can convince her otherwise. I mean, he is a, bise a bisexual chaos monster, so that does track. Uh-huh. <laughs> that feels on brand for his kind of chaos, and I don't love that for him. But I think you're right. <laughs> I think you're right. It's one of the things I, I I like least about Sanderson's finishing of the series is that that wasn't addressed by Matt and Tuon, and there wasn't a plan to rid the Empire of Damane by the end of the series. Yeah, it's a really big miss on Sanderson's part because RJ, whether or not he was ever going to get to an outrigger, he was clearly setting himself up to ask hard questions. Yes. With that. And yes. then Sanderson softballed it. Yep. And that's, you know, I, we, what we would have gotten if RJ hadn't gotten stupid sick and stupid died. But, yeah. I I, I would love an I can fix her arc of Matt falling in love with her. No, I swear. I can fix the slavery thing. I yeah. just have to make out with her one more time. <laughs> 
that would be fun. Like some taming of the shrew mixed uh-huh. with like abolitionism. Yeah, yeah, like, totally, totally. <laughs> I can solve slavery with my dick. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm here for that. And then Talmanis is in the corner just like, but I wanted to bone you. Like, it's just, uh, someone write that, please. <laughs> All, All right. right. I'll, should I leave? This this? Yeah, yeah. A staff and a razor, because that's the two things he buys in this chapter. And Is like a stave. Stave, sure. Staff has an F. I always say that wrong. That's what you get for reading things your whole life. Instead of, I thought staff was S T A V E. Oh. And S T A F F was a misspelling or an alternate spelling of it. That that is super fair. I did not know stave was a word, and, and then because who the hell says stave out loud? What, when in your life have you ever heard someone hand me that stave? Oh, if it weren't for my, if I only had my stave on me, like, no, no, it's only in fantasy. I mean, in books like this, yeah. Right, right. That, that would be it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, it took me way too long to learn that staff wasn't spelled S T A V E. That's awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Matt had never really expected Luca to leave Jurador only after one day. The stone-walled salt town was wealthy, and Luca did like to see coins stick to his hands. So he was not exactly disappointed when the man told him that Fallon Luca's grand traveling show and magnificent display of marvels and wonders would remain there at least two more days. Not exactly disappointed, yet he had hoped that his luck might hold good, or his being to Viren. But then... Being Tavirin had never brought anything other than bad that he could see. The lines at the entrance are already as long as they were at their best yesterday, Luca said, gesturing expansively. They were inside Luca's huge, gaudy wagon early in the morning after Renna's death, and the tall man sat in the gilded chair at the narrow table, a real table with stools tucked under for guests. Most other wagons had an affair rigged on ropes from the ceiling, and people sat on the beds to eat. Luca had not yet donned one of his flamboyant coats, but he made for up but he made up for it with gestures. Latell, his wife, was cooking the breakfast porridge on a small, iron topped brick stove built into a corner of the windowless wagon, and the air was sharp with spices. The harsh faced woman put so many spices into everything she prepared that it was all inedible, in Matt's estimation, yet Luca always gobbled down whatever she set in front of him, as if it were a feast. He must have a leather tongue. I expect twice as many visitors today, maybe three times as many, and tomorrow as well. People can't see everything in one visit, and here they can afford to come twice. Word of mouth, Cawthon, word of mouth. That brings as many as Ludra's night flowers. I feel almost like a Taviran the way things are falling out. Large audiences and the prospect of more. A warrant of protection from the High Lady. Luca cut off, abruptly looking faintly embarrassed, as if he just remembered that Matt's name was on that warrant as being excluded from protection. You might not really like it if you were to Viren, Matt mumbled, which made the other man give him an odd look. He put a finger behind the black silk scarf that hid his hanging scar and tugged at it. For a moment, the thing had felt too tight. He had spent a night of bleak dreams about corpses floating downstream and woken to the dice spinning in his head. Always a bad sign. And now they seem to be bouncing off the inside of his skull harder than before. I can pay you as much as you'll make for every show you give between here and Lugard, no matter how many people intend, attend. That's on top of what I promised for carrying us to Lugard. If the show is not stopping all the time, they could cut the time to reach Lugard by three quarters at the least. More if you could convince Luca to spend whole days on the road instead of half days, the way they did now. I'll stop there. It's not really a good sp- stopping spot there. <laughs> no. And our symbol is the dice, we should mention, for what should be very obvious reasons as we go through the chapter. This is a heavy dice rolling chapter. And yes, I agree with the with the gif in chat from Schitt's Creek. We're just going to clap at that. <laughs> A good read. That's Luke a good is read. Luke is always fun to read. I was so. I was like, oh boy, Seth's gonna do a Luca voice. <laughs> <laughs> everyone has fun doing. It. Everyone who has ever read a passage out of Watt with Luca has fun doing a Luca. Oh yeah, voice. Luke is so like, much fun. Like Michael Kramer, Kate Redding, Gus, you, me. Like Luca's fun. Mm-hmm. Luca's just fun. <laughs> okay, so this is the point where I think Matt has more than one set of dice rolling in his head. Mm. Okay. 
I only identified one, but... Okay, woken to the dice spinning in his head, always a bad sign, but now they seem to be bouncing off his inside of his head harder than before. Mm. And there's a point when he buys the piebald, when he buys the razor, they ease off a little bit. One of the sets of dice stops. Okay. I think that it's phases of giving the horse to two on. Because the yeah. last set of dice stop when she accepts the horse and gives her a name. Yes. Because that cements his marriage. Because that, that's when she's like, all right, uh, yeah, fine, yeah, I'll yeah. say the words. I'm not going to say them quite yet, but like mm -hmm. in her heart, that's when she's like, all right. That's when she falls in love, me. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's the perfect gift for her, right? Like, Right. But there's layers to it. Because first he has to get the right horse, and then he has to present it the right way, and then he has to respond correctly to her response to the horse, which is running it away. And like how he responds to that is the final, final, final test slash roll of the dice. Tumbling set of dice. Yes. Okay. So I was... I was thinking it was one instance of dice in the sense that I was thinking it's about the horse, but you're right that there are multiple sets of dice associated with the horse. So things to keep an eye on for the next five chapters where we're with Matt is every time the dice ease off or lessen a little bit, that's what I'm looking for, because that means a set of dice has stopped, but we can't tell because there's still more dice going. Right. Right. And there's a lot of dice going, which is why it's not like, oh, one set stopped and the other's still going. It's because like, there's like three or four going it's, it's a lot of noise yeah that makes sense um we get a timestamp of you know they're going to be there for two more days and how fast they're traveling just kind of as context against the rest of the plots um and then yeah kind of reminding us of the safety logistics of what's happening with like luca not necessarily caring about matt's safety but he'd also just care about his own people's safety right lucas makes an argument in this chapter we got to stay here and milk these people for all they're worth. In the next chapter, they all have to, you know, do a threat display as a community and then bail the next morning, which is what Matt thought he wanted because they're like, oh, no, now we got to bounce. Like Luca does have safety in mind. He just doesn't have Matt's personal safety. At mind. He has his people's safety in mind. Yeah, his people can't make money if they're not safe. Exactly. Like, and, and you can't make money from people who would rather kill you. They tend to not be very giving when it comes to the coming to your circus thing, if they're trying to burn it down. Why do you think Littell hates Matt? Any reason in particular? Or is it just like Matt being Matt? I think it's a personality thing. Yeah. yeah I think it's just like, it's the way that Matt and Luca don't like each other. It's, it's the same kind of thing because Littell really likes Luca. So what she sees of Luca and Matt, she's going to see in a disfavorable light and just take it extra personal, you know, but, and she probably also, it's a bit of Luca's attitude rubbing off on her because she just really wants to do whatever he's, he's doing. But, and she didn't like Nynaeve either, kind of irrationally. And Nynaeve and Matt are very similar people in a lot of ways. So I think it's just a clash of personalities. I, I was also thinking that none of Matt's, none of the people that hang out with Matt, none of their wives like that they hang out with Matt. Right, like, <laughs> and also that, yeah. But I don't think it's that because Luca doesn't even like Matt. I think it's just that Latell is racist against Two Rivers people. Mm. I was thinking it might do something with the fact that like they have this cover story that they're that he's with Lylewin. Well, and then there's that there. He talks about that in this chapter that the show folk are an oddly prim lot, even the contortionists. Like, wow, even people who dress in flimsy clothes and like twist themselves into pretzels have moral standards this is such a shocking combination which is like those things have absolutely nothing to do with each other like stop there, there very much is this assumption that the contortionists are also prostitutes right like there seems to be that sort of overlap in his brain yeah and then shaming sex workers for not having a moral compass at all right right which is like or just, the, I guess not prostitutes so much as strippers. Yeah, he sees them as the next thing to sex workers and gives them the associated derision that you would expect with that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like the stigma of that. And it's like, I appreciate that RJ was like, no, even if that were true, no. <laughs> like, I like that RJ has it in there that like, no, the fact that the show folk are seen as loose, immoral, transient, other 
people they actually have quite a strict uh sense of morality and mm-hmm. like that makes a lot of sense when you consider how minorities actually manage to exist like say within america like trying to go for like model minority shit being like well if i'm extra good then people won't mind so much and it seems to be like the amount of prudishness here in the show is indicative of being like no we're going to be like super conservative super correct so that way no one has any issue with us aside from the part where we're a carnival <laughs> like we are still technically a circus so we have that going against us it it kind of feels like the opposite of uh you know when people go to church and so they're like i'm a good person so i can be a jerk to the rest of my life because i go to church like there's mm. that psych- psychological mm-hmm. thing study mm-hmm. they've done where basically like if you think you're part of a good group or uh, you know being a good person in one aspect of your life that gives you the freedom to be less good in the other aspects of your life. Sure. Um, sure. And so sort of the same thing only in reverse where it's like, Oh, well people think that we're this sort of no moral society. So we have to be more moral to make up for that. Right. Exactly. Which is not great. Sure. Just get to live your life. But yeah, it's, um, it's nice that RJ doesn't just have them being the only people with loose morals, you know? Like, it's nice that he has, like, the very, like, honor-bound, code-bound Aiel being the ones most flippant about nudity, you know, for example. I kind of feel that way. So I live in a condo where everyone else is an owner and I'm a renter. And I feel like I have to be super on top of, like, following all the rules and keeping everything really nice yeah. because I'm renting. And I wish the owners would fucking do half the things. They, like, they don't take care of this place. And I feel like I have to because I or there's, everybody's watching me. And I have absolutely get told... Hold on to my fucking rental company if I violate a rule, you know, but I watch the owners do it all the time. There's no one to report them to. Right. Like it's it's just this ridiculous double standard. I want to talk about this flock of crows that pass overhead. What are you, Sean Chan? What? Looking for superstitions? Uh, n- no, I'm for just talking omens? about the dark one's eyes. Right. Um... I guess. Cr- I mean, crows and ravens both could be. I guess he usually uses ravens. He he conflates ravens and crows in ways that are deeply inaccurate to how ravens and crows actually behave. So, but this is a flock of crows, not a flock of ravens. So I'm assuming these aren't coded as the Dark One's eyes. Then. I mean, I, I don't know. With RJ, I truly, like, he did not respect <laughs> bird biology at all. Like, I'm not a biology person, but his ornithology knowledge was, like, woefully insufficient. The man spent too much time looking at books and not enough time looking at birds. I mean, the amount of time he spends talking about how to buy a horse <laughs> in this chapter. I'm like, you couldn't bother looking up a single fact about birds. <laughs> I mean, being a horse, good at horse flesh, I mean, that's integral to Matt's character, though, you know? Whereas knowing anything about birds is not. Fine. Fair point. But still, RJ didn't... I mean, these could be the Dark One's eyes because RJ did not know how to tell birds apart. But that does have him thinking about the dead people he saw on the street yesterday, which, yes, he's, he's like... He was convinced that's what he'd seen. Of course, that's what he saw. Right? There's dead people everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. He And he immediately leaps to the obvious conclusion. Well, that must be a Tarman Gaiden warning mm-hmm. sign like that that there's no real interpretation for me a sane person seeing ghosts other than the end of the world that is and he doesn't panic he's just like okay okay that's happening cool 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 but like you know again he's been prepared for he at this point basically knows he's in a story mm-hmm like, he right. understands that about himself. He's like, okay, I am the main character in an epic novel. Like, that that tracks. All right. So the, the climax of the books are coming soon. Okay. Makes sense. And then he spies on Rand. And I want some up, someone to walk up to him and go, Matt, it looks like you've seen a ghost. And he's like, no, I've seen the dragon's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Just as white. Just as white. Because you know Rand's oh, ass yeah. is white that as is... hell. Yeah. Oh, that is that is a full moon white <laughs> ass, for sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's essentially what happens. He thinks of Rand in the color swirl, and he gets a full-on glimpse of, of Rand and Min kissing naked. Yeah, and then he thinks about it like a second later, and like they have advanced beyond kissing, and it's like, <laughs> mm. awkward. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, you know that your friends have sex, but like, you, you don't want to accidentally suddenly be seeing your friends having sex that is a wholly different thing than objectively knowing that your partnered friends have sex like i mean there's just too many people in the room when rand and men have sex right every time every Every time time. it's right it's too voyeuristic for for good sense 
LTT is there all the time, Constantly. right? Constantly. Matt and Perrin can check in at any moment without, by accident, just by thinking of the wrong thing. His other three warders have to choose to, like, block themselves off or go far away from him, like, every time he gets, you know, Randy. And then Elaine's warders also have, like, a <laughs> Vienda, or, um... But not when he's fucking Min, necessarily. I don't see why it would translate through Avian or through Elaine to Brigida. I feel like it, it's attenuated out at that point. Maybe I don't know, but I mean, if Elaine I is, so. if Elaine is as involved as it sounds like she is, but over that great of a distance. Mm, well, sure, 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 sure. Yeah, I mean, when, when they're all in the same city, it's very different than when they're spread out across the continent. <laughs> and not to mention, I mean, and Rand's using fucking uh, as, uh, Morden's body basically at this point, right? Like they're basically sharing. So you know, Morden's feeling everything. Rand's feeling everything. That, that, <laughs> with Min being my favorite character, I do not like that. <laughs> Rand throws the worst orgies. <laughs> <laughs> he does. He does throw the worst orgies. You, me, and everybody in my head. <laughs> Super Sky, like, Min is my favorite character because I've just decided to ignore all the things that are wrong about her character that RJ just put on the page on accident. You like that she's a smart reader who figures things out and competes with people who are a lot more powerful and holds her own. Exactly. And most of that happens off page and you have to sort of read between the lines. And a lot of the stuff that she objectively does on the page is less great. But I just memory hole all the things that happened and replace it with things that I know did happen because of comments that are made occasionally. And then she's my favorite character. Have I mentioned parents, my favorite character, too, for the same reasons? I just memory hole all the things I don't like about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the beauty of fiction is you're yeah. allowed. <laughs> nope. Timber's home. Timber's home and his human. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, obviously. <laughs> there was something. Oh, okay. There's one thing on his walk. I want us I want us to note he's just going to walk the half mile to Jurador. Now, do you, do you consider a half mile to be a long walk or a lot of walking? Me? No. Okay, and Matt, historically, on record, has not considered a half mile to be a long walk. He has walked 10 miles in a day and considered that to be mid. Like, just put, put a pin in that. Because <laughs> later he's going to bitch about how much walking he's been doing. It was a half mile. Half mile. Matt, that is not a lot of walking. You yourself. Now, in fairness, uh, he is, he did break a hip. Yeah, but he's like, oh, my hip doesn't hurt anymore unless I walk a lot. But I did walk a lot today. And I'm like, sir, you walked half a mile. That is not a lot. That means your hip still hurts. Stop lying to me. Your hip is still healing. Just shush. Of course his hip is still healing. Right? Like, a major break like that six weeks later, it's not like suddenly bone heals and then it's never bad again. But he's trying to ask me to believe that. And I am telling him to sit down and repeat back what he just said to me. <laughs> Slowly this time. Matt lies. He really does. Oh my god, is he a cat? He, this is Chef. Oh, uh, come here, Chef. Kitty, kitty. I mean, I also see Never, but, but it's the cat. Yeah, yeah. It's kitty. <laughs> this was Never's cat, and now he loves me more. Aww. He looks like a chonker. Oh, yeah, he's lost some weight since we put him on a liquid diet. <laughs> Excellent. And kitty. there he goes. Oh. Um... Okay, so do, 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 do. I also there's a line here. So he's headed into town, and he thinks a man with a little lace at his wrists was an altogether different matter. I'm just like Matt, you and your lace. He doesn't. He doesn't like lace. He needs lace. He doesn't like how it looks. He needs the aesthetic. It's a costume. He has to pretend to be rich because he's not actually rich, right? Mm-hmm. He has to pretend to be rich to fit in, right? Because otherwise, he if someone thought he was drunk, he might get thrown out. But with the lace, that's his get-out-of-jail-free card. Yeah, it has nothing to do with his t growing taste for the finer things. Mm -mm. Yeah, definitely <laughs> nouveau rich, not 
old rich. Well, he, ex- very, very much, mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. much. He is like lottery rich at this yeah, point. Yeah, easy he come, has easy no go. Idea, yeah, what to do with this kind of wealth? He has never planned on having this kind of wealth. So yeah, it's just funny. He's like, no, 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 I, I don't like it. I, I need it. Like, okay. I love it later on when he realizes after he marries Tuan that he actually like owns an empire. Like, like I have more. Mo- like, oh. I'm an emperor. That means I own everything. Like, when he tries to steal from the Sean Chan, he's like, wait, is that just stealing from myself? Wait, does that mean I... Wait. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, man. That is that is how marrying nobility works. That That is... Yep. Yep. You had books to realize this. <laughs> so he's out shopping. You know, I, I don't have a whole lot to say. It's a lot of world building. Fun reading, I think. But nothing... No commentary about it, right? Agreed, agreed. This chapter to me, this and the next chapter, both really feel like the skill that he was developing during the slog has finally matured. And he can just do this really nice, like, pages long panning shot where there's all these interesting characters and world building textures and just beautiful detail. But yeah, there's no need to comment on it. It's beautiful, it is what it is. Matt finds the U bow from the two rivers, which. I, did Jordan just put it there because he wanted Matt to have a bow back? Like, I I just, what? Taviran? Yeah. I, that's all I got is, like, Taviran is bringing the stuff to him that he wants. It's like... I think it's the, it's the wheel rewarding him, giving him a little treat for finally starting to get with the program and go with the flow. Mm. He's actually leaning into the flow and like doing what Rand said, you know, like if you try to lean in, then you can control a couple of things instead of pushing up water uphill constantly. And so I think that the wheel is giving him a little treat as a reward. The pattern wants you get married. So here's I'm going to ease your path. Yes. Now that you're following now that you're not fighting getting married. I'm not forcing, you know. If he was trying not to get married, maybe it would force the horse into his hands, right? At some point. And he's right. like... Uh, and- right. But because he went shopping, he was able to like get the extra bonus quest on the side. Mm-hmm. Without getting in like a fight. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. He just like, you know, happened to catch the hot spot and then roll a nat 20. And yeah, he got the extremely rare prize for no fighting. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I, I looked up the Black U thing, and I don't have any... There's no reference to Black U getting sold. There's nothing... Like, it doesn't really... It's not a big plot point. I always thought it was going to be a big deal, you know? This is one of those things for me that I read and was like, oh, man, he's got a Two Rivers bow. That's going to make a difference at some point. It shows up in his character arc when he's working on it and when the peddler sinks into the ground and he thinks about how the bow isn't done yet and he wishes he could have you know used it to kill the man like it it shows up for him as an act of creation but once it's done yeah i was expecting him to like start setting the ashandari aside or lose the ashandari or something like that and not use it as a weapon for some reason and have to switch back to his two rivers roots and become like the archer that he was always supposed to be. It's supposed to be Rand with the sword, Perrin with the axe, and Matt with the bow. The Ashandara is like so out of left field that I was expecting him to revert to his bowman archetype. And then he didn't. And yeah, it felt like a bit of a a bit of a dud. But I really enjoyed the arc of being like, oh boy, the two rivers guy is gonna get like a two rivers bow. This is gonna be great. I enjoy the build up. I just it doesn't leave you anywhere useful. Mm-hmm. Or like impressing two on somehow with it, right? Like I think that would yeah. have also been a good thing, right? Like if somehow like look at my skill, I can shoot so far and, that she somehow yeah. says, you know, she makes a bet with him that nobody could shoot something at a certain distance, you know, 400 paces or 500 paces. And he goes, I can. And she goes, Tuan, if you, you know, Toy, if you think that, I'll, mar- you know, I'll finish the marriage ceremony or something like that. And he does it and they get married, right? Like something like that would have been really cool. Sure, sure. Because, I mean, the Ashendar is a great weapon, but it's just like, why are none of our two rivers boys bowmen? When like they are the English they are. archer yeah. archetype. Well, Rand at this point doesn't use non-power weapons anymore. There's no he, point to yeah, it. Sure, but the Ashandari is not a weapon that most people resonate with when they're coming from a place of being kids reading fantasy books, right? Like if you're a nerd who's into like SCA shit, then yes, you're into halberds and pikes and all kinds of fun. Oh yeah, pole, shit on. It yep. turns out pole arms are superior to swords in almost every way. 
just with the like someone comes out with your sword and you have a pole arm you just stick it with them before they get close to you yeah for sure but like you can't set up a culture of people who's known for their bow skills and then have all three of their sons that go out into the world have all of them not take the bow <laughs> into battle with it. it's like come on one of them one of them i totally get Perry needing the axe i get Rand needing to use magic which means that matt is fucking around with a pole arm for some reason he's not from pole arm people he's from ranged weapon people Birgitta, honorary two rivers bowman fine i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> i mean her and her and matt get along really well right the bowmans yeah they do they do they do they do he at least very much understands how to use them right he understands the cranks the crossbows uh longbows like what their strengths and weaknesses are and he uses them very effectively in battle yeah, no, for sure. I mean, we do get lots of fun archery stuff. It's just this this stave really set up a lot of expectations that it did not follow through on. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, this was definitely Chekhov's gun that never got pulled down off the shelf. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. it just stayed there. So the next thing we have is the razor. Is the razor, which I recently learned is not a zebra. Yeah, I mean, I... I still think it's a fucking zebra. I'm still always going to headcanon that it's a zebra, it's right? Like, not, though. But it's not. It's yes. literally not. Like, Robert Jordan was thinking of an actual kind of horse with this coat pattern when he wrote this. He was not thinking of zebra. I forget what they're called. But they exist. I learned this on Wheel Takes last week. <laughs> only last week? Because they only just read this recently. Oh, yeah. No, so this is, yeah, this is definitely not, I should look up the actual kind of horse it is. But, yeah, it's not, I always thought it was a razor because of the, you know, alternating straight and black white stripes. Zebra. But there actually is a horse, isn't it just, just that the edges of its markings are sharp? It's not yeah, so much that they're straight. Look look up horse that is that looks like a zebra. I'm sure you'll find the name and I will remember it from the episode. Because I should have taken notes on that because I knew we were getting to this. But yeah, d zebras are not domesticatable is is the real the real reason why it was always I thought it was a weird fantasy thing like he was doing like peaches or poison. But no, in his world, zebra are still undomesticatable and the actual horse horse uh, that is this kind he was thinking of and wrote that into it. All I'm getting is uh, the crossbreed. Eh. Well, that's on me for not bringing my notes on my homework the paint horse the apalooza american saddle breed nab strooper the morgan these are just candidates the mustang Keith put in chat soralski's horse i have no idea if i'm saying that right that looks very hmm. well anyhow just let it be known that robert jordan was very much not thinking of zebra he was thinking of a kind of horse and I know that because someone on the internet said so. Ah, of course. Fire Phoenix has got us. Here's a quote. American painted horse. That's what he was thinking of. Okay, that was one of the options. In, and then he said, in fact, the memory fits so well that I decided not to check whether the actual horse looked the way I recalled it. <laughs> <laughs> the recollection made a terrific image. So he just knew that painted horses existed and was like, why not in zebra stripes? Why not? That's super valid. I feel like there was a more in-depth explanation on wheel takes, but I did not do my homework correctly for that. So Yeah, but that but that's the quote I've seen where he says, Oh yeah, I, I remember seeing a horse. It wasn't a zebra. So I, I do so I read it, right, and I thought it was a horse with odd markings. And then someone told me it was a zebra, and I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. And then I saw the quote, and for years I believed it was a zebra. And then I saw the quote where he was like, nah, it was just a horse I saw somewhere. And so now I'm just like, well, okay, that's less exciting, Robert. It is, but it is more accurate to the fact that zebra are impossible to domesticate because they basically don't have a social hierarchy like horses do. Horses go in herds that are matriarchal in terms of most of them. And then there's just like the one stallion that keeps in charge of stuff. Zebra don't do that. They just move in massive herds like wildebeest or something. Like they don't have a leader. So they, you can't, the way that you domesticate horses is you dominate the lead horse. And then the rest of the herd is like, I guess we're following what you say now. 
you can't do that with zebra there's not that switch in their brain for like oh you're on top now i listen to you they they just it doesn't exist you can't hijack their propensity to follow the leader and according to grace they don't run quickly oh that makes sense though because you don't have to run quickly you just have to get away from the lion long enough for someone else to get at yeah also they kick and bite Whew. zebras are mean zebras are closer to i think donkeys in terms of how mean they are right yeah. so yeah domestication is a very rare set of traits combination of traits right there's only and and i was reading interesting theories about you know why do people in europe it, it, it was actually an interesting argument talking about basically that it's much easier to get east west in our world than north south oh, yeah, just yeah. because of the way continents are and so that like you have both more trade but both more domesticatable animals you know in europe because of that because the one animal can very easily be moved the entire exactly. east west yeah i remember this from guns germs and steel yeah yeah which i mean i there's a lot wrong with that book and his thesis but mm-hmm. there's a lot right with the information that he gathered to make the interpretation that is ultimately flawed like Mm -hmm. a lot of the observations that he lays out in that book i have found to continue to be true even as his specific conclusion has sort of gotten swiss cheesy i also saw a funny thing that was oh humans were domesticated by wheat that that is a michael pollan argument yeah that (laughs) that we were domestic that like who who's domesticating who now who who (laughs) is bending over backwards to make who reproduce who is devoting all kinds of resources to uh, unrealistic amounts of propagation? For who? I like beer. And like, <laughs> if you, I mean, and then you can even think like just plants in general. Maybe, maybe they want a warmer planet. Maybe they're tired of this icy bullshit. And so they got us to, <laughs> to make global warming happen. So that way they could just be all warm and cozy forever. They're like, bring our ancestors out of the, out of the soil, out of the stone. Look, we've used, we've locked away too much of this carbon. We really need some of this carbon dioxide back. Could you exactly. go ahead and just please, exactly. but yeah, like it's all on the ground. We got to get it out, put it back in the atmosphere. You know, really create that tropical, make make sure the bull point is way too hot for humans to survive in. Yeah, because these fuckers have like 12 plant species thinking they're better than the rest of us, and it will not do. <laughs> you know what? Fuck the green man and fuck plants. That's what I'm saying. They don't, they don't tell me what to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, did we domesticate ourselves? Are we cyborgs because we use fire? Like, th- these are questions. These are questions. Fun questions. I, I don't have answers. And fun I'm gonna, questions. Yeah, but yeah. Have, have fun staring into a campfire, pondering that at two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> back to the book. Back to the horse. Back to the razor that is not a zebra. Her presence here was as mystifying as Black U. He had always heard no Damani would sell a razor to any outlander. He let his eyes sweep past her without lingering, studying all the other animals in the stalls. Had the dice inside his skull slowed? No, it was his imagination. He was sure they were spinning as hard as they had in Luca's wagon, which, of course, means they're not, right? Right, right. And I I could believe that maybe one of the sets did literally slow down because it's like, hey, it's like it's like when you're in a video game and the little like pingy noise gets like faster and higher pitched because you're getting closer to the hotspot. So I guess, you know, there's a debate to be had whether it's one set of dice that is slowing down every time he gets closer to his goal, or if it's multiple set of dices that are one of them stopping every time he accomplishes something significant. I prefer the second theory. One set of dice that just keeps picking up, dropping off and picking up? No, that there's multiple sets of dice. Yeah, yeah. 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 So kind of like setting multiple alarms in your... uh, you know, phone. <laughs> yeah, that does. And he, him being the ADHD representation that he is in so many ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that would make sense that the universe is like the wheel is like, yeah, I'm going to need to set multiple alarms for this guy. Otherwise, he's not going to get the hint. The next two pages is Matt Dickering. Yeah, I this is where he complains about having walked a lot, which I again say a half a mile is not a lot. A cu- I, I like I get I feel like I've taken a lot of advice from Matt's dad about how to sure. deal with people. <laughs> There's a lot of fun stuff in this in this chunk. Yeah. Right. Of these these like sayings and if you can get someone to laugh at the start of the dickering, then it'll go better. Right. And like, the best, you know, one is where you both think that you came out ahead. I, I just I find that kind of like country advice. Like it's been helpful in my life. Also, we get mention of the rats getting 
bigger and nastier Mm -hmm. and fighting Mm -hmm. back against cats this is a recurring theme and that that is important to note that's just embedded in the middle of all this dickering Mm mm-hmm no, and I, and I love how Matt's like, never heard of a razor, and the guy's like, mm-hmm, I bet you haven't. You, you seem to know your horse flesh really well. Mm-hmm, but you've um, never I've heard never of a razor. never heard of a razor. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, okay. uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, there's just a lot of that going on between the two of them, and yeah, like, it's, it's uh, like Fire Phoenix says, it's got rules, right? There's this, it's a very scripted conversation that's, like, going on, yeah. and Matt's kind of explaining the rules to us in his head as he goes along and does them, but also there's a lot of unspoken rules, too, so... Yeah, it's a fun conversation, but I I don't have a lot. It is fun to say other than ooh, fun. Yeah, very much, very much. And then he he leaves with the horse and thinks in his head about how oh I don't know why the dice stop sometimes I really don't know. And then like on the very next page, he's like, the dice sure stop mysteriously around two on a lot for some reason. And I'm just like <laughs> Matt, you are so not getting the hint right now like it's you you get it like you have all the pieces you're laying them out in front of us and you are just refusing to connect the dots oh he knows he just doesn't want to admit yeah but there, there is sometimes i'll admit that when the dice stop and even we are just like i don't know i don't know like that i don't know what that is why that did that there's been a couple of times where there's just no way to figure out like what the dice stopping means for sure but it happens around her a lot yes <laughs> yes which again i think should have more implications for the last battle i think that would have been more fun if the relationship had more it would have been nice if non-channeling men and women collaborations were just as important as channeling men and women collaborations that would have been nice and and certainly there was the part where they worked together to fool everybody that they had been in a fight and she had like run off and then he invoked her to come back at the right just at the perfect moment to save the day right there was a little bit of them working together in that way to win the day but under the false pretenses of fighting and just yeah. leaning into the fucking stereotype all over again instead of showing the world that collaboration is better yep <sighs> yep yeah I, I and i think that that was one thing that jordan was really setting up that again well, i hate saying this but sanderson didn't quite pull off was the how much the collaboration between men and women was starting to happen right the the black tower was bonding the, this double bond was going back and forth right Matt and Tuon, Rand and uh, Moraine, uh, she was supposed to come back more as his equal, right? And they were supposed to work together. Like, there was just all these equal things that were supposed to happen where it would show that men and women working together were going to overcome them working separate. And I feel like there's just not, that theme kind of got dropped off a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Speaking, though, of men and women working together, Eludra is taking possession of not just a multiple wagon loads of stuff but the wagons themselves mm. i think maybe mm-hmm. those are the chassis for her very first dragon carts oh that's a yeah that makes sense maybe possibly i thought it was just for carrying her stuff around because she's got so much that was what i thought too but just as i was saying that i was just like you know she does have to to cannibalize at least one wagon to make a prototype before she can like you know do more. So nope, good call. I, I think that that's happening. Um, and he also thinks that he he's had some thoughts on why she wanted a bell founder, and the only one that makes sense doesn't make any sense. And that's just you know teasing us with our with our uh, first stage knowledge, right? About like cannons, 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 cannons are so close. Cannons are coming. Cannons are coming. And what do you think she's buying in the barrels? I'm assuming like the gunpowder ingredients, like the base mm-hmm. uh, saltpeter and potash and stuff like that. Guano. Guano. <laughs> well, probably specifically saltpeter because this is the salt town. Go- oh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And maybe also potash because that's part of. No. Glass making. That's glass making. Glass making and salt making are not the same. They're both very hot, but they're not the same thing. Well, I, I could imagine, right? You To make salt, you're going to dry a lot of moisture and they may create a lot of ash they may be burning off a lot of like liquid they may be boiling off a lot of liquid creating a lot of ash oh, so yeah. they could have a lot of hardwood ash that you can or whatever yeah soap makers and firework makers and all kinds of people could come by for that waste product that would make sense yeah so i assume that she was stocking up on bulk because she's in a town that's got some of the minerals she needs but uh mm-hmm. 
Oh, Keith points out, unless they're mining the salt, in which case they're not boiling any moisture. This is land. This is a, a, a land-bound area, yeah. so it's probably not tidal salt. No, it's probably mine salt. Yeah. So, so much for the potash uh, idea. Yeah, probably not potash, but I bet a lot of of the salty stuff that she needs for. Which, yeah, saltpeter is is salty. I'm, it's not one of those weird words that like says one thing and isn't the thing. You know, I don't know what saltpeter is. I feel like I did briefly. Maybe it's one of those things like refried beans where like they were not fried once or twice and yet they're called refried, but like literally they weren't even fried once. I mean, they kind of are. They're literally not. I made some today. They're literally not. <laughs> I throw them in a pan with oil and smash them around and cook them, right? No. You cook oh. beans and then you put them in a food processor and you smash them like that. I said so I do it and it feels it seems like I make something that's very similar to what comes out of the can. So Ah, there's a link. Potassium nitrate. Sharp, salty, bitter taste in a chemical formula of KNO three. Ionic salt of potassium and nitrate. Oh, so that's how they're making TNT, basically, with the nitrate from it's saltpeter. Dynamite. TNT. Woo! <laughs> the salt served in the Vatican. <laughs> Salt, Peter. Salt served at the Vatican. <laughs> you do uh, purify it using uh, boiling mineral water. So potash is back on the menu, boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So she's 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 buying some really dangerous combustible shit in large quantities. Well, it's not necessarily combustible until she combines it, but she's buying some caustic, nasty stuff that can only be handled with like PPE. So, and, and Matt says he had some thoughts on why she wanted a bell founder, but only one that seemed to make any sense actually made no sense at all that he could see. And so I assume he's talking about using, making bronze yep. lofting launchers, tubes. Yeah. lofting tubes, but he doesn't understand why you would launch fireworks so far. Yeah. And he does eventually present that to her. Like, I, I think you want this, but I can't figure out why. And then she looks at him for a minute and he's like, oh, and and then we have cannons. Uh, here's where he sit, talks about the dice stopping too often in Tuan's presence. Mm-hmm, Duh. Mm-hmm. Women were certainly as unpredictable as any honest dice ever made. Uh, just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's unpredictable. Yeah, I'm going to go with people are as unpredictable as any honest dice ever made. <laughs> but yeah. And then he, he does one of... One of our, our all least favorite things is he knocks and enters Tuan's wagon without like pausing between the knocking and entering. He just does them all with yeah. one motion. And I think we can all universally agree that that's rude and should not be door entering procedure. Even if you are paying for the door, that doesn't actually give you a right to invade someone's like privacy. That's just right. not polite. You're not, you're not my parents. Get the fuck out. Knock and wait until I say okay. And even if you are my parents... Get the yeah. fuck out. Like, no, parents don't have that right either. No, but my parents, uh, uh, you know, took it. <laughs> I had very respectful parents. They understood the concept of privacy and uh, were, were very clear on what that did and did not entail. And yeah, barging into my room was not a thing they were going to do. What's that like? I mean, fantastic. I have problems unlike all my friends. All my parental trauma is really unique. <laughs> because they were so good and respectful that they gave me problems that no one else can share in. God, that must be awful. I mean... I, I'm, I'm glad my parents uh, abused my trust like normal parents. Jeez. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Sometimes it's awkward. But, you know, could be worse. Um... Oh, here we get the the great line where Matt's trying to you know get all of her away from the influences of his uncles. He doesn't if ever, if he ever figures out who's teaching him the leer, you know. Uh, Matt, right after he talks about uh, Solusha with her great uh, bosom on display with the new dress that got sewn for her, right? Like today, Solusha was in the dark blue Ebi Dari dress that displayed her memorable bosom so well. It's like yeah, you were leering. That's what you were doing. Yeah, and he thinks about... Timber agrees with you. Yeah, Timber does agree with me. And he thinks about how he wants to spend more time with Oliver to get him away from whoever's teaching him to leer. And I'm like, Matt, 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 look at me. Matt, no. (laughs) The phone call is coming from inside the house. Very much so. 
He also, this is the part where uh, we see Tuon wearing what looks like an impossibly complicated dress that was made overnight Mm -hmm. from the silk that Mm -hmm. he bought, which like on the, okay, I say impossibly difficult. I have made clothes and actually thinking about it, I think this is probably like a Roman style, like drapey dress. It just got pleated all to hell, which honestly you could totally do in a night. Like pleating is not that hard. Like, this is not a fitted gown, I don't think. I think this is much flowier than that. I think this is Robert Jordan's ignorance when it comes to um, how long it takes things to get stitched and sewn. Like, it's just not that fast of a process. Enough people working together on the right kind of design, it can be. I mean, there yeah. there is a whole line of so easy, it's simplicity patterns out there. There's a whole world of one afternoon projects out there. There are dress designs you could pull off in an overnight with multiple people working on it. I'm choosing to imagine that that is the pattern that was chosen. But yeah, if it's a fitted gown, um, RJ is completely off his rocker because yeah. that is not how sewing works. I have sewn dresses, pants, shirts, undergarments, done repairs, done alterations, done upcycles. That is not how sewing works. All right. So Matt busts in on Oliver and Noel having a nice afternoon with Tuan and Solusha. Mr. Sonnen is off somewhere, which we will learn in the next chapter is with the Aes Sedai, watching them have drama with the Suldam. There's a great paragraph here where he's just talking about how much he likes Tuon. Oh, yeah. This this is, again, it's like, you've stopped fighting it. You have completely allowed this to happen to you at this point. You are no longer in any way resisting. Without that veil, it was plain that heart-shaped face belonged to a woman. Her big eyes were dark pools a man could spend a lifetime swimming in. Her rare smiles could be mysterious or mischievous, and he prized them. He enjoyed making her laugh, too, at least when she was not laughing at him. True, she was a little slimmer than he always preferred, but he, if he could ever get her arm around her without Solusha there, he believed she would feel just right. And he might convince her to give him a few kisses with those full lips. <laughs> Light. He dreamed about that sometimes. <laughs> I don't know this guy on this podcast. I don't know what's happening. I'm not sure where I am. <laughs> uh... <laughs> well, is that not just out of a romance novel? Just straight out of a romance novel? I've only read the one romance novel, and it was not as an audiobook. So <laughs> I am not the person to ask that question. What I'm learning is the creepy voice, uh, that I'm a little too creepy with the voice to read uh, romance novels. People are not reacting positively to that <laughs> voice. It just seemed a little sinister. Oh, uh, okay. All right. All right. I'll work on that. Yeah, it, it, it was, I don't know. There was just a little too much mustache twirling and like finger t- <laughs> fingertip tapping. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, I don't. Maybe that's how romance and audiobooks go. I I don't know. Honestly, I wouldn't either, which is probably the pro- part of the problem. I will say though, the very first romance book I've ever read, *Concert of Fire*, was fantastic, and I highly recommend you all get it before the sequel comes out in August, because that was fun. It's a very horny dragon. Uh, it was a little bit uh, uh, *Tarval and After Dark* is kind of what I was feeling. Yeah, that was. It was giving me erotica sedai. Yeah, yeah, yep. <laughs> which that's definitely what I had in mind. Yep. Yeah, which again, like phone sex is just slightly sinister, like by definition. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> really, I wouldn't. Okay, I mean, like the way er- 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 erotica sedai does not give me good vibes. just put it that way erotica Hmm. sedai makes me want to like check all of my pockets and purses to make sure that like everything is still where it should be (laughs) just feels seedy so this is where we get the the uh, one of my least favorite nicknames uh in this whole series which is precious Ah. yeah gag gag me with a stick it's the only thing i like about it is imagining Gollum. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's yeah, exactly. the only redeeming right? factor is i can right? splice a little lord of the rings in but like matt isn't Gollum, and tuan isn't a magic ring of evil i mean she kind of is evil but like she is a person not an object it's just yeah i i i like that he's attempting to get on her level and spar with her on her terms 
But the part where he picks that name and then pretends to not know he's playing a game kind of sour me on the actual attempt, if that makes sense. Yeah, we'll be interesting to see who wins this game toy, Matt Slip. Game? It's like, what do you mean? Yeah, you're giving her a nickname. Like, it's it's obvious whoever says their na- actual name first, right? Like, it's so obvious that that's what you're doing, dude. Like, mm-hmm. play the game, fine. Like, don't admit that you're playing it, fine. Don't pretend dumb. Don't play dumb. Just don't. It's it's like we're standing on a basketball court. You toss me a basketball, and when I take a shot, you go, "Hey, what game are you playing?" It's like y- basketball. Yeah, yeah like, yeah. like what, yeah. what do you think? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, it's a terrible choice of nickname. But um, I also hate the whole toy thing, so I'm like, sometimes you got to fight fire with fire. Right, right, right. They're both treating each other like crap. We get a little bit of knowledge drop from Noel about Shara. Shara! Which, again, I love the foreshadowing here. Love that, I mean, it was clear that Robert Jordan wanted to bring them in somehow as a culture. Yes, yes. He he did not drop them in out of nowhere. He dropped the Demon Dread connection in out of nowhere. But, like, Shara itself, I was expecting them to come busting in at some unexpected moment for many books. Because of because of really good little lore drops like this, and also the Sean Chan basically did it right. Like, yeah, exactly. Like, okay, so like the potential for there being a mysterious army on another continent showing up unexpectedly is on the table. There's more continents in this planet, right? And then yes, we hear constantly there is in fact another continent separated by a sea of sand. So you see women of any age, but no men above twenty. And so uh, it, remind me about the culture. They just kill all men above twenty, so nobody can ever channel. I thought that was just for the sons of women who could channel. Because he's saying that the Ayad live in villages. The Ayad are the channelers. And in oh, those the Ayad. villages, okay. that's what you see. But that's not true of Sharn society outside of Ayad villages. Got it. But yes, within those villages, there are no men over 20. The only men that exist are men that women who can channel gave birth to because it's a toss of the coin every time you get pregnant and they do keep them around long enough to procreate with i believe right that was my understanding as well yeah they they stud farm them until they're likely to uh channel and then off them i really hope that it's like a humane cup of wine kind of offing and not just like a shoot them behind the shed kind of thing Mm, i'm willing to bet it's the second but the first would be easier, I would think. Cheaper. Oh, God, Nem Tuck. Young, hot men in your area. <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, Super Sky Lake, they're either killed at 21 or when they start channeling, whichever one comes first. Mm. Other Sharans intruding into those towns are also killed. And par- permission must be granted for the Aya to leave those places. Well, that sounds very uh, broken earth. Mm-hmm. With the origins and their prison slash refuge. Thank you, Fire Phoenix, for grabbing that quote from the wiki. Yeah, and there are male channelers with the Iod, so are there? Yeah, the, I thought there in, were in the final battle. I thought there were. I thought there weren't. I thought that that was only no. There there. are because remember, Demondred has a full circle. Oh, oh, you're right. He has like the seventy two, right? Like the full. Mm-hmm. Oh. Mm-hmm. In an effort to sow chaos in Shara, demanded release them from bondage and taught them the channel. They all called themselves the Freed, so those are the male channelers. Oh, and that was part of his quest in River of Souls. So that's what he's doing right now, right? Basically, that's where he's been. He, he's doing a men's rights activist blogger arc to, to prominence. He's Andrew Tating all over <laughs> Shara. <laughs> well, and now, right, the the... Source is cleansed. They're not going to go insane anymore. True. He knows that. True. So he doesn't have to worry about them being ticking time bombs behind him at all. That's, I mean, honestly, there's, it's so frustrating to me how much Demon Dread doesn't feel like a bad guy at the end. He just, it feels like the day after he betrayed the light in the War of Power, like, but you're a good guy. Why are you with the wrong people? And it's like, but we're 3,000 years later. Like, how are you still giving me the feeling of someone who only just turned or shouldn't have turned. Like, I thought you'd be more committed by now, you know? All he cares about is killing Rand. Him and Lanfear really need some therapy. Like, take some MDMA. Like, 
listen to some psychedelic music and just like cry it out like god <laughs> i'm also like why are you even bothering to kill him he's just gonna get reincarnated again it's it's such a silly goal it's so silly like if you believe that rand is the reincarnation of lewis there and telemon right like he died ltt died right you're just trying to take out his reincarnation i don't get it i don't understand the point of killing somebody who is without stopping their reincarnation yeah it's, it's a very silly goal are you just spawn camping is that is that just basically just wanna, like, basically yeah like <laughs> yeah just like rude welcome back from totally run real pop right like yeah so yeah we get not just the shara lore drop but also some uh oh shit this is jane farstrider <laughs> Laura drop <laughs> right in case you hadn't figured it out robert jordan's like by the way in case none of you figured out that jane farstrider is noel or noel is jane farstrider let me just lay it out yeah you know? yeah let me let me just spell it out yeah yeah and he and he does it in a great way with like you know Oliver being like again like from the mouths of babes truth right mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Oliver is so defensive of jane that Oliver like that noel like wants to like comfort the kid but also like hate himself and so he has to like, thread this really weird line that just yeah telegraphs to the reader like oh because <laughs> like i only suspected at this point like i did not need this for my confirmation because i'm not good with clues but like this this was the confirmation i needed when he was like threading this line with oliver well, at, at this point, he, you know, he, he starts complaining about what Jane did wrong, right? He went gallivanting around the world and left a good and loving wife to die of fever without him there to hold her hand while she died. He let himself be made into a tool by, and then his face goes blank. And then the programming kicks in. Yeah, that's compulsion Woo! right there. That's a Shawn Michaels, like... Randall's. Oh, no. Yeah. It Grand is a Well, I think it is a Shawn Michaels, right? Because a Shawn Michaels talks Grand about... Aldo. The fact that Ashamael is the one, yes, but timing, I don't think she was around. Right, we just know that he was in her abode at Natron Sparrow. Like, she was there. He was yes. there. The, the broken old yes. man sitting in the corner looking unhappy. So there could be something of Grandel in there, but you're right. Ishamael is is what he's trying to reference there. Because Ashamael is the one who brags about taking him and sending him back. Yes. Not with them not knowing what they had, right? Like basically setting him up as a trap. Grandal picked him up afterwards and did whatever she did. Right. But. Right. But yes, yeah, staring at Matt, rubbing his forehead as though he's trying to recall something. It's like, come on, Tavir, and just pull it out. Just override the compulsion. Right. And I also then love um, Matt's reaction to watching this whole thing go down with Noel. It's like. If Noel had put the boy off his favorite book, Matt was going to have words with the old man. Reading was important. He read sometimes. Sometimes. He did. <laughs> Matt. I no, love Matt that Matt. he thinks reading is important for Oliver, but like he doesn't actually live that life. It's it's like the leering thing is annoying, but the reading thing is cute because like he is trying to do better for Oliver. Right. But like it's 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 cuter here. <laughs> Matt is not into book learning. Matt is street smarts, getting by by the seat of his pants, gambling, right? He never had to learn skills out of a book. He actively thinks that the travels of Jane Farstrider never grabbed him the way that it grabbed Perrin and Rand. He literally thinks that. He's like, I mean, that's fine, I guess. But yeah, he's he's a hands-on learner. He, he doesn't do abstract learning. He wouldn't read The Wheel of Time. He, he fucking <laughs> would not. He totally no. <laughs> would not. <laughs> um, and then the Sean Chan show up. And so we all all the alarms start going off because yeah emergency 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 <laughs> yeah Jewel and Bustin being like there are Sean Chan within a hundred foot radius of us I am gonna go to my wife who's freaking out And that goes right into chapter seven, the cold medallion, where the symbol is the Adam. Um, and there's no, I'm not even going to pause. I don't even think we need to read in because honestly, like, it, it, it's truly, just continuing. Truly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Julian comes in and says, I'm going to go check in with these, these, and these people. Matt says, all right, let's go handle these, these, and these people. We have a little discussion about how Egyanan will not answer to the name Egyanan anymore. She is very much Lyle now. And Matt 
still isn't there yet but Noel's like that th- you're fighting a losing battle at this point dude like she's that one that that is who is and like I appreciate like Matt, this this thing with Egyan and is so or with Lawan is so funny because on the one hand, call people what they want to be called. Right. On the other hand, when someone is deridingly given a nickname and then clings to it because they're having some weird reaction to the person who was bullying them, you want to encourage them to stand up to the bully. Right. And not accept it. So, like, Matt is in a pickle where there's not really a right decision other than to wait and see where she lands. And at this point, Noel is kind of letting us know, like, she's landed on Lyle one. Like, that yeah. is the name that she's using to forge her new life. Like, whatever the reasons. And she's moving forward. She's never going to be a Sean Chan captain again. Yeah. She's never going to be a Sean Chan again. No. No. And it, it, it doesn't matter where the name came from. It represents the the never againness, mm-hmm. <laughs> the moving forward irreparably ness of all of that. Plus, she also got stabbed in the back yesterday and watched her entire life flash before her eyes, and she's currently sleeping it off. And I believe, like the next day, her and Doma get married. <laughs> oh, like very very shortly after this. I'm not sure quite how shortly, but very shortly after this, her and Doma get married. And I'm positive it's because she watched her life flash before her eyes and watched Doma freaking out as she died in his arms, and then was given a second chance at life. And it's like, all right, I know what's important. Wait, what happened to her last yesterday? She got stabbed by Rena, and then Matt oh, had to chase her down okay. and shoot her with a crossbow, right, and like, woke right, from right, dreams right. of women floating in streams. Like got it. she stabbed Lylewin and and yeah, she like in that in that second chance at life, she's like, Oh, what's important is is my new life, is this man, is what I have now. Nothing that I valued before matters anymore. But she has to sleep off the healing before she can get married because like that was a lot. That was a lot. I like that he uh, toys like, Oh, you're not gonna tell us to stay inside and he's like, You said you wouldn't leave, so I'm trusting you. And that like when it gives her a big gets a big smile for him from her because it's like oh yeah they're trusting each other finally mm-hmm. and and she, for her that's such a foreign concept right she's never been with someone she could trust no but like also it's like okay you're willing to accept the rules on my terms a little bit or the game on my terms a little bit he's like he trusts her right she's not used to being able to trust people sure but she is used to people like accepting her word. And not believing her to be a liar. Like, that's something that, like, she's she can't accept people calling her a liar. That would be ridiculous. So for him to to trust her is like, okay, I guess I can take you seriously. I guess whatever overtures you're making, you're making on my level in good faith to how I see the world. Like, they're, they're coming to a to an accord. <laughs> it's courting. It's courting. This is court. This is Sean Chan High Court courting. So then we have these three assholes at the gate trying to get in without paying. I didn't see the point of this scene. We don't see these characters again. It's not like he forges any sort of alliance with this captain. Is it, it just like gets him out of the tent at the right time? Like, I don't know. I, I, I was very... This little mini scene confused me. It's, I think, mostly world texture. But as far as plot forwarding, it does move the circus forward by the end of the day or at the start of the next day we we open this episode with him thinking it's going to be two or three days before we can move and because of this encounter they move tomorrow morning gotcha so okay that's the plot reason i do think though that rj put it in here in the detail he did because he wanted to humanize the shanshan military showcase how the settlement's working there's this line that the standard bearer says where she's like part of our job is to make sure that the home folks don't think that we're we think we're better than them. So like I'm assuming that they are the forward guard of like settlement, right? They are the guards to wagon trains going across the prairie is kind of how I'm seeing them. So I want to think that our so I think that RJ is like the invasion's not just military conquest of armies, it's also this slow tidal progression. And, like, it's catching up with them, right? As they move across the countryside, like, they are, this tide is running up against them. And RJ just really decided to be like, let's make more human dimensions 
to the military of the Shanchen while we're here, while I need the plot to move forward. Let's really dig into that. And also, then we get some fun stuff from Matt thinking about being a leader of armies rather than a soldier, <laughs> which is, you know, always fun to get into Matt's head for that. Because he's like, oh, yeah, I would sign this woman up in my military unit without question. I know exactly where she would fit. She's very good at her job. And absolutely not. I am not working under you. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, and that, that was the most interesting part to me was like their conversation afterwards where she's like had dispersed, you know, dispersed the folk by trying to recruit them. He thought that was pretty clever. Right. Yeah, she tries to recruit him, basically being like, you look like a good spearman. And he's like, yeah, I have an Ashendari, but that's not, <laughs> you know, like, uh, you know, like this, just stuff like that, where I, I enjoy their, their little little banter, um, especially because she read him really, really well. And he was just like, mm, nope, not a good soldier. When it's like, of course you are. You're, you're a battle leader and a general and like an amazing soldier. She called, she saw that. Well, I think what he meant by that was that he's a general not a soldier yeah i think that's well, how he meant yeah. it <laughs> he's like i'd make a terrible soldier because i'm a general and i i don't take orders like that i'm not dumb enough to be a foot soldier no 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 i know how to to be like you and mm -mm. <laughs> that's a good point yeah yeah no i wouldn't i wouldn't just fight in a battle i, I would command it or run away from it or gamble exactly. on it yeah exactly yeah, it's it's a fun encounter, but again, it's it's more world building than plot forwarding. All it does is showcase that the that the circus is able to defend itself visually, but that they also skedaddle at the first sign of trouble. We'll get into the skedaddling next chapter, but like that is the relevant plot part. Uh, so then he's making his way towards the Aes Sedai caravan, right? Is that he's checking in on them because they're Sean Chan. For, yeah, because because the news of Sean Chan will freak them out, basically. And uh, yeah, he gets there and he's about to go up the steps and then he feels his medallion go cold, which means there's channeling. And he's like, I am still coming down off the adrenaline of seeing, of dealing with the Sean Chan military. And I don't even know if they have channelers with them. Like, I don't I don't need this right now. So he busts in. And in this case, I agree with him not waiting for being allowed into the door like okay i get it like <laughs> the medallion goes cold you bust in the door like that's like smoke coming out but the magical equivalent right and yeah he goes in there and it, it's a it's a mess where we are mid fight when he busts in yeah yeah and and i i kind of want to start at the end and there's a summary where he asks what happened and someone tells him yeah okay i got it i got it there was an argument. Jolene wanted to go see the Sean Chan for herself, and she wouldn't be argued out of it. Bethaman decided to discipline her, just as if she had no clue what would happen. She tried to pull Jolene across her lap, with Sita helping her, and Edesina wrapped them up in flows of air. That doesn't account for all I felt, says Matt. All of them look at him in surprise. Bethaman channeled. I've never seen the weave she used, but for the few, but for a few moments until she lost the sore, she had sparks dancing over all three of us. I think she may have used as much of the power as she could draw. So that's what happened. Is Bethman essentially like there was this discipline moment, right? Jolene was being getting out of hand because she's the one who never got captured, so she's being all sorts of arrogant. Bethman tries to stop her from going out. The other I said I wrap Bethman up in flows of power. Bethman freaks out because she's being wrapped up in flows of power and channels unconsciously for the first time. Jolene grabs her and starts smacking her because she's channeling dangerously as an un, you know, because she doesn't ha know how to control it. And that's when Matt walks in. Right. Right. It's it all happens very fast. Nobody makes good decisions. And the the only takeaway is that the inevitability of power spilling out of Bethman and Sita has begun to happen. Right. That's the important part is that the inevitability of them becoming channelers is uh, it, it's common. The, the eggs are cracking. I thought the spanking was the important part. Isn't is it in Robert Jordan's writing the spanking always the important part? We do have a very protracted spanking scene here. <laughs> and it's it's just so frustrating on so many levels. It's it's. First, you walk into Jolene beating up a woman who arguably did far worse than anyone else. But in fairness, she had tried to beat up Jolene first. And then Matt comes in and decides that the only way to fix all this beating up is some more beating up. And he 
Spanx and Aes Sedai, who is centuries old, until his hand hurts. It takes so many paragraphs. <laughs> because she smacked him. Because, yeah, he grabbed her mid-blow and she just spun and whacked him upside the head with the with her other hand. Yeah. Which, like, I mean, I get reacting poorly to getting hit in the head when all you're trying to do is stop people getting hit in the head. Like, I get it. But, like, he just keeps beating the shit out of her because this is his one chance. You know, and it just it 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 just the joke goes on way too long. It gets so uncomfortable. And he's also punishing her for chan for the channeling, mm -hmm. right? For trying to channel, right? Because he doesn't know it was her. But yeah, basically. And, and yeah, yeah, there's this there's all this weird vindictive, vindictive baggage between them, and it's just really uncomfortable. Um, and then Mistress Anon, like you know, forces an end to it by just walking over and staring at Matt, so that way he he decides that he's done now. Because now mom is looking at him and she's very angry. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But I mean, Jolene has been very ridiculous for like books now. Right? Like. Yeah. I understand his frustration with her. Right? Yeah. No. Something had to happen and her hitting him upside the head for the audacity to stop her beating a woman up is like. Yeah. I mean, like a, a, a bit of a reaction is to be expected. But this was not it. He could have just been really, really loud. He could have hit her back once and been like, now do you like it? He could have. Right. There's so many things he could have done other than spank her for like a page and a half. Yeah, I feel like some, some there's something magical about spanking where people uh, don't think of it as the same way as hitting. It's not hitting, it's spanking. It's different. And it's like, no. Or, or even the difference between, oh, S Jolene was slapping Bethamon versus like if i say well matt should have hit her back you know like the word we use it feels different but the action is the same unless you're being like super weak wristed about it like such a thing as like you know like the like eh, sort of like super slap like that's a that's a wimpy slap but like everything else is is hitting it's all hitting and like yeah if you get hit in the head you you're allowed to bark back <laughs> but it did it, it RJ's need to put spanking into these plots is not our favorite. Yeah, yeah. And there's never seen like a swat on a butt, like, and a spank. And like, I totally, if if she had hit him upside the head and he had just automatically hit her back the exact same blow, sure. I would have been like, valid. That would probably be valid, my reaction yeah. is like, because what he does is he grabs one arm and so all that energy comes out of her other arm. So I'm like, that energy can ricochet back a couple times and, and, and be mm -hmm. discharged and it's fine. But this whole, I'm going to spank you like a child, is just like, these are, this is a woman who was an eyes to die before your grandparents were born. And you, you get to do this. This is, not that he needs to have the respect, but just that RJ would have a woman of that age and magic and respect be, be able to be dominated so easily by this punk with a stick. Just because he has a fancy toy around his neck, like, <sighs> though, though. Though, the fancy toy around his neck, when the flow's melting off of it, does give him a chance to talk to Satala about it, which is fun. We, d we do like that part. Yes. Yes. I, I also like the way he's like, hey, you two, dr you know, stop holding her. And they're like, how did he know? And it's like, well, someone was. And, like, I can tell your chant, like, I'm not a... The, I, I like it when I said I get their own tricks used against them, basically, of just, like, using observation. We see that with Perrin too. I think it might have been might have been Rand, but I think it was Perrin where they just make educated guesses about who's dominant in a relationship and thus who is leading the circle because they just they mm -hmm. know people and it's like you don't have to see the flows to know the relationships. Like there's five elements in two of you. It's not hard. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you know, so one of the reasons Satala Nan wants to talk to him about the Tarangriol is because she was Martine Janta. Right? Who was the, the Aes Sedai who was burnt out studying Terangriol. Right, the last one before Elaine, who made a study of Terangriol at all. Yeah, she, she, she is Elaine, like, in another, you know, advanced in her arc as a, as a Terangriol tinkerer and engineer. Like, this is how Elaine, this is how Elaine reacted, was, huh, that's interesting, can you do it again? You know, it's a scientist response. And she also mutters under her breath about things that make the Aes Sedai super suspicious of her identity right, she's right. able to just brush it off with some Ives to die obfuscation like normal mm -hmm, and she even tells mm -hmm. Matt later like they could see it if they wanted to 
Like, I, I haven't done that good of a job of hiding. If they wanted to know, they would know. Yeah, she's she's like, God, how did you pass your test? You're such a win. Right, you know? and, right. And like, well, they have, and like, well, how do you know about the testing, right? Like, that's something that no Aes Sedai would ever talk about. And she's like, I owned it in. You know, people talk, and they're like, mm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. she's like, moving on. Anyway, Matt. <laughs> and they accept it. They accept it, right? They don't never. Because they don't want to know. They don't really want the there's there's questions you don't want the answers to. They're they're carefully avoiding those questions. So <laughs> Matt slips out of the out of the barn and I like his little interaction with the warders. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, a little, were you involved with that? Uh, how could I have been? Uh I'm not, I can't channel. It's a room full of channelers. How could I have been spanking somebody repeatedly? Very Satala Anon one paragraph ago of him. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a it's a fun interaction because Jolene has her pride. And as much as I don't understand pride and don't appreciate it as a general character trait and don't under, don't get it, she has displayed a very particular kind of pride that makes this very easy for me to understand. She of all people is not going to want to admit what happened. She's not going to want them to know she couldn't defend herself blah blah blah. That's super on brand for her. It's dumb, but it's on brand. The only other thing I have is them deciding what to do with Bethaben. Do we let her die? Do we train her? Do we take her to the tower? And they kind of debate over that. And that that's going to be a theme that keeps coming up. It's sort of the new bone of contention with this group of women. It's not settled here. It's just, you know, Teslin's like, do we let her die? I want to let her die. And Jolene's like, no, it is, but we can redeem her. And Teslin's like, but you don't know what she did to me. And this is actually an interesting point because... Jolene says, I don't know how horrible it was for you because you will never tell me. You just say it was bad. You just say it was bad. And that's, I think, an interesting point because in the world of disability, there's a lot of people demanding proof before you get sympathy, understanding, resources, anything. There's a lot of prove it to me. Show me the deepest, darkest, most damaged parts of yourself so that I, a stranger on the internet, can judge you worthy or not. And that kind of reminds me of this, where she's like, can't you just trust that my experience was awful? Do I have to relive it in high def detail for you to believe my lived experience? It feels a little bit about like PTSD and people coming back from war of like, they don't want to have to explain to you every traumatic experience they went through while they were fighting because it's doing that is reliving them. Yeah, we, we don't owe that to you. You yeah, need to just right. believe my lived experience rather than demanding because like if you're demanding proof now like why would any proof i offer be good enough you'll just move the goalposts again right 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 but also you know i do get the like you can't keep asking this rhetorical question and not expect a literal answer also like if if you're gonna keep asking well you 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 can't ask rhetorical questions repeatedly and not give me the ability to engage with that so like i get these women are too many women in too little of a space it's a theme with these circus arcs yes and, and I think on the other side of that, there is this just basic human decency of this person is discovering they can channel. We don't let those people die. Right. We just don't. Right. There are right? human like, rights that no right. amount of crime exactly. exempts you from. Right. It's like the worst criminal deserves a lawyer and and no cruel and unusual punishment. Right. right? Those are part of our laws for, for a reason. And the same thing is going on here. Like, no matter that she was an awful slaver, we still train people who are learning how to channel to the point where they're not a danger to themselves or others like that's what we do it just is what it is and i and i agree with that take like the let her die thing is emotionally i get it teslin but you need to be overruled and she and she does let herself be overruled reasonably easily on that point because yeah it's it's a hazard to to other people in addition Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but yeah that was the only other thing um i had before the readout and I'm just going to read the final paragraph. With Sean Chan camped across the road and I Sedai arguing and women channeling as if they had never heard of the Sean Chan and the dice spinning in his head, not even winning two games of stones from two on that night could make him feel anything but wary. He went to sleep on the floor since it was Doman's turn to use the second bed. Egyan and always got the other with the dice bouncing off the insides of his skull but he was sure that tomorrow had to be better than today. Well, he had never claimed to always be right. He just wished he was not quite so wrong so often. (laughs) 
Nice. I am glad we did those two chapters in one day. That very much felt like one unit of story. One day. It did. Morning to it night. did. Yeah. Don't think we needed to break that up at all. And that second chapter was short enough that, uh, yeah, I think that worked because we, we were, uh, we're only at 140. Yeah. So if we're under two hours of recording, that's definitely a good combo. Under two hours on a two twofer. That's 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 how you know it needed to be compressed. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, and going through that, there was a lot that I just wanted. Like I said, beautiful prose, but nothing that I wanted to um, that I needed to talk about. Like we either needed to do like a ten hour episode where we talked about all the beautiful prose, or like a one hour episode. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like I mean, neither of us are horse people, so all his detailed descriptions of how horse anatomy works is like. It's beautiful prose. We can become horse people for the duration of this episode, or we can just skip it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and and admit that I read it, and I read it, I enjoyed it, I enjoyed learning about horses, I enjoy that information, um, but it's not very plot relevant. It's it's just a nice, beautiful background for us to have the actors on stage for. Exactly. Exactly. It's one of those chapters you really should just go read it yourself. You don't need us to tell you what happened. You need the prose, as RJ wrote it. And, like, this, you can't summarize prose. That's kind of the thing about prose. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's why I did a very long read-in as well, right? Because it was just, there's just a lot of prose. And I think enjoying it is uh, a part of these chapters. you were away i was just telling them that uh everyone everyone on this podcast needs to know everyone who listens to this podcast needs to know that seth was just on my other podcast ah yes i was i had a blast (laughs) i gotta tell you what that's probably the most fun i've had being a guest on a podcast mostly because like it's your podcast so it feels very real time spoilers (laughs) in terms of like it felt like coming home yeah it is certainly is yes um but then also like i love your co-hosts they were a delight to talk to and um i think they were honestly shocked that i well she said she was shocked that i kept up with the conversation well i mean she's right she has traumatized many a man like person on discord servers by just going in swinging on the menopause conversations and pregnancy conversations and ma- many i've seen it happen many times that she's you know it's just not everyone can keep up which okay i i don't i don't get it like i don't get why it wigs people out it's basic human biology it's one of those things that's just like same thing with pooping right like people are like oh my god pooping's disgusting i'm like everybody does it we all have to deal with it we all have buttholes right that's the one thing that unites us all we all started off as assholes truly in every sense of the word truly. um <laughs> 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 babies are assholes uh they they just by definition um but also in in the womb right that's the first thing that develops right we we develop right. from our butthole outwards it's, it's literally how that works and so like yeah the, and the same thing with like uterus we all came from one mm-hmm. the the process of creation of life is fascinating mm-hmm. and i should actually i don't like the creation of life reproduction of life is a better way of saying it sure um, sure that thing that's not cloning but it's not not cloning right it's like first they're your cells and then they're not your cells but you're making them happen like it's but it's not a clone <laughs> no very fascinating yeah. yeah fascinating fascinating stuff so yeah for context guys everyone go listen to hot nuance book club season two episode don't hard launch a period on a girl it's really funny that we had you know our first guest be a man for the period episode <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. um but also it was it's also the episode where she gets her magic sword. So, like, there was a lot to talk about, um, and it was really, really fun. It was a really good episode to have a guest on, I think, because of how much the 
mystique around periods is a very universal problem. Right. So it was really nice to have a guest perspective in to talk about how that particular piece of that book like factored into our childhoods. Um, but yeah, it was really funny uh, timing. That was not deliberate. I really wanted to bring you on for like the, the boss next, battle chapter. The, yeah, the final chapter. <laughs> but I was a dumbass and somehow thought that the boss battle chapter didn't need to be its own episode mm, and mm -hmm. also thought that somehow bringing a guest on also meant that we could do two chapters in an episode and like both that was just a layers of bad decisions this is also a book with six chapters they're not like you know you're not talking about a 50 chapter book here this i mean yes it's a short book but these chapters are big a lot happens in each chapter a lot happens in each chapter and um yeah even as we were trying to work out the schedule for you brie was like aradia we need to like lower the amount of pages we do per episode because this is actually too much like your schedule is calling for too many pages as we move forward i was like okay i got to adjust that but yeah you have your silly only working you're only free every other wednesday thing so, yeah, yeah the yeah. schedule was just it's it's hard it's like anything else with scheduling adults to have a good time and not just work for the man right it's hard it's really hard to schedule adults to have time together so you you ended up on the period episode <laughs> and it was it was fun well and, and i should say you know a lot of the first adventure that book was one that i found at a very young age i never found its sequels but i did read it until the cover wore out Right. Like it was one of those books that like was a comfort book for me for many, many years as a kid. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was one of my favorite books. And I, I will talk about it anytime, anywhere, even the period uh, chunk of it, because as a kid, it was my introduction to periods in a lot of ways, which I think is really a nice way to come full circle on that. And, and literally way more stuff does happen in that chapter, like lots of. Yes, other yes, yes. <laughs> that's that's the only chapter. the first like couple of pages of it. Then there's like a whole, you know, going to the ruins and finding the magic sword and yeah, lots of implications. Yeah, it was it was very fun. Um, so, yeah, everyone should come over and join us on Hot Nuance for the whole season of season two, which we're doing the entire quartet, which was, again, why I had to rush to get Seth on, even for not the most logical chapter, because it was like. But then we're going to get to book two and you don't have the same relationship to book two. No, so it no. wouldn't. It just wouldn't work. And like, I didn't realize you had this relationship to it. So we were halfway through and then, oh, my God, we're almost done. So like schedules, man. Schedules. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?